Hello and welcome to lecture 54. This series of lecture is based on my book, Manual of Fluid Electrolyte and Acid-Base Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I am Dr. Mohamed Tinawa. I am a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. You can find the book on Amazon as an ebook, paperback, or hardcover. Now today we are going to start a new chapter, chapter 8, and this is metabolic acidosis. Part 1 is introduction. What is the definition of metabolic acidosis? With metabolic acidosis, we have a reduction in blood pH. Blood pH is low by definition. Why is it low? Because we have a primary reduction in serum bicarbonate. Now, because of that, we are going to have compensation, respiratory compensation. So this means that carbon dioxide, arterial pressure, PaCO2, is going to go down. So bicarb is low, and as a compensation, CO2 is low. Now, metabolic acidosis can be acute or chronic. Acute, like you see in sepsis, okay? You have lactic acidosis, uh, accumulation of organic acids, or it can be chronic, like people with chronic kidney disease, where we have problems with the primary uh, renal acidification. Now, an ion gap is when you take sodium and, and then you subtract chloride plus bicarb. So based on serum anion gap, we have two types, two big categories of metabolic acidosis, either anion gap metabolic acidosis, also known as organic acidosis, or non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, also called hyperchloremic acidosis because chloride is high, or mineral acidosis. Now, what's the difference between acidemia and acidosis? So normal arterial blood pH is 7.35 to 7.45. Intracellularly, it's lower, much lower, 7 to 7.3. Now, when we are looking at a blood gas, arterial blood gases, and we see a low blood pH, this is acidemia, okay? So let's say we are looking at a blood gas pH 7.1, 7.2. We call this acidemia. Now, the process is called acidosis. So the acidemia can be either due to metabolic acidosis or due to respiratory acidosis. So never say metabolic acidemia. That's wrong. So acidemia is low pH. The process, which can be metabolic or respiratory, is called acidosis. So if serum bicarb is low, then the acidemia is due to metabolic acidosis. On the other hand, when the PaCO2, the carbon dioxide pressure, is high, then the acidemia is due to a respiratory acidosis. Now, we said usually when, when bicarb is low as a compensation, PaCO2 should be low. Well, what if bicarb is low but PaCO2 is elevated? then we have a mixed acid-base disorder, meaning we have metabolic acidosis and respiratory acidosis, like someone with acute asthma. So when we have a simple acid-base disorder, we have a change either in serum bicarb or PCO2, and then you have compensation. But when you have a mixed acid-base disorder, then we have two or three processes going on at the same time. What about acid production in the body? On average, the body makes a lot of carbon dioxide, 15,000 millimoles per day. On the other hand, it uh, produces about one millimole per kilo per day of hydrogen. Now, the body needs to get rid of all this acid, so it eliminates volatile acid, CO2, okay, via the lungs, and also it has to eliminate organic acids like ketones, like lactic acid, also inorganic acids resulting from protein metabolism like phosphoric acid, sulfuric acid. What about buffer systems? Now, you studied that in, in general chemistry. As a reminder, buffer systems prevent large changes in pH after an acid load or alkali load. The most important buffer known to everyone in the extracellular fluid is the bicarb CO2 buffer. So if we add an acid, HA is an acid, okay? When we add that, what happens, the buffer 
is going to react. So bicarb is going to get converted to CO2, and then the CO2 is going to be blown off by the lungs, and the pH is going to change much less than if the buffer wasn't present. So when we combine HA, which is an acid, with sodium bicarbonate, the buffer, we are going to get water, no problem with water, CO2 will be blown off by the lungs, and then Na, which is a salt. So this way we averted a big problem. Now, if you have a lot of acid, like chronic metabolic acidosis, people with chronic kidney disease, then the bone will act as a buffer and that results in release of calcium, but that's not good for the bone. This is why you get renal osteodystrophy. Now, what about inside the cells? Inside the cells, you have several buffers. You, have, you still have the... Uh, uh, proteins, okay, that though they can buffer some of the acid, but that can change the protein. So uh, if you have severe acidosis, that's going to be a big problem. Um, you have the bicarb hydrogen co-transporters, okay, they can uh, direct the traffic, if you will, um, and we'll talk about that uh, later. Um, and then you have the organic phosphate compounds, and we'll talk about the role of uh, phosphate as a buffer system also later. Now, Henderson-Hasselbalch equation is very important. Uh, removal of acid or alkali from the body depends on two things. The lungs will blow off CO2, okay, they regulate CO2 excretion, and the kidneys will regulate bicarb. So between the lungs and the kidneys, we have a maintenance of acid-base status. Now, these processes, these two processes work in tandem according to the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. And as a reminder, it says that pH equals 6.2 plus the logarithm of bicarb divided by 0.03 times PaCO2. Okay, so the 0.03 times PaCO2 is in the numerator. Now, if we don't want to deal with pH, now as a reminder, pH is minus log H. So you take the hydrogen and it's minus log um, or log one divided by H. Uh, based on the rules of logarithm, it's the same. Um, if you want to just go by hydrogen, then hydrogen equals 24 times PaCO2 divided by HCO3. So under normal conditions, if you imagine the PaCO2 being 40 and the bicarb 24, then hydrogen would be 40. 40 what? 40 nanomoles per liter. So let's talk about the units. Bicarb is measures, measured in milliequivalents per liter, which is exactly the same as millimoles per liter. So I'm going to use these two terms uh, interchangeably. So milliequivalents per liter or millimoles per liter is the same for bicarb. PaCO2 is always in millimeters of mercury. Now, hydrogen is measured in nano equivalent per liter or nanomilmoles per liter. So it's, it's the same. Now, a normal hydrogen concentration is 40 nano equivalent per liter, which is 40 times 10 to the power minus 9 moles per liter. Okay, because nano is 10 to the power minus 9. Uh, now, when you have 40 nano equivalents per liter of hydrogen, this is equivalent to a normal pH of 7.40. Now let's take an example, and, and you can use any uh, 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 calculator um, uh, like on your smartphone and, and you can get the results because it has logarithm. So if you have a serum uh, bicarb of 10, you have a PaCO2 of 23, you have a pH of 7.26, um, and uh, this will correspond to hydrogen of 55 nano equivalents or nanomol per liter. Um, also online, you can uh, you can find many sites that has the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, and you can plug the numbers, and you can know exactly what the pH is, what the corresponding hydrogen is. So you can do that with great ease. What about respiratory compensation for metabolic acidosis? For every one millimole per liter decline in bicarb, there's 1.2 millimeter decline in PaCO2. So if the normal bicarb is 24, it drops to 14. This is a 10 drop. 10 times 1.2 is 12. So the PaCO2 should drop from 40 to 28. This is called respiratory compensation. But you should not have normalization of pH. If the pH is entirely normal, then probably you have metabolic acidosis and respiratory alkalosis. And this scenario, when you have non-anion gap metabolic acidosis and respiratory alkalosis is seen in salicylate intoxication due to hyperventilation, also hepatic failure and uh, sepsis. 
I am going to uh, end here, and uh, in the next lecture, we'll talk about pathophysiology of metabolic acidosis. See you then.